Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week is the 25th anniversary of Windows 95. In fact, it was released today, August 24th. And I thought I would give you some memories of Windows 95 and its release night because I was very excited about it when it came out. And I thought we would also run Windows 95 pretty much in a stock configuration here on the Mister because they recently came up with a new core for the Mister that allows it to simulate basically a 486 in an FPGA. Let's get to it. So August 24th, 1995 was the release day of Windows 95 and they built up quite a lot of hoopla around it partly because those of us who were computer enthusiasts back then were getting very frustrated with Windows at the time. This is Windows 3.1, and we can actually boot it up here on the Mister real quick with the AO486 core before we go over to Windows 95. By the way, they recently updated the AO486 core. It's now running at 486 speeds, and it kind of simulates a higher end 486 for the time. So what you'll see here is what you would have experienced if you had, you know, probably a two or three thousand dollar computer. Uh, so here is Windows 3.1. I'm not sure what happened to my program manager here. Uh, and one of my gripes with it was that it was buggy. Um, things that you were running on Windows here would crash sometimes, and occasionally they would bring down the entire system. Uh, and it was also hard to know what was running in the background because as you loaded up programs, there wasn't something that you could very quickly access to get a list of everything running. You could pull up the task manager here by hitting control shift escape and I would do that quite frequently, but there was nothing kind of built into the interface that helped you manage what was running. And even if you were really diligent, uh, you would run into situations where uh, you would minimize a few windows and realize you had a whole bunch of stuff running in the background and it was never good to have too many things going uh, on this old version of Windows. You couldn't put files on the desktop. Your file system was kind of shoved away somewhere. You could get at it, of course, within each of the applications. Uh, they did have a file manager application that allowed you to browse your files and move things around. But back in the day, I have to say, the Mac had just a much more intuitive graphical user interface. But dollar for dollar, the PCs were faster and more powerful. So it often felt to me like, well, this was a decent enough compromise because I didn't really want to buy an expensive Mac and I could get a super fast GUI uh, with a somewhat okay operating system. And for me, that was enough back then. But that's why Windows 95 really was a big deal. Uh, so let's close it out here and we'll load up Windows 95 now and have a look at what changes they made. All right, so let's reboot this thing into Windows 95 and see what happens. This is the B variant of Windows 95, but it's pretty much the same thing as what I experienced on day one back in the day. And one of the things that was a big change in Windows 95, of course, was the interface. And this is the interface that we largely still use today. The start menu, the task bar, Pretty much everything that we know Windows to be right now began with this version of the operating system 25 years ago. And I was very excited about this. In fact, I think the interface was the biggest uh, thing that made me want to upgrade so quickly. Uh, what I liked about it was that you now had the taskbar down here. It was very easy to find running programs. You could just right click on one and click close like we do today to get rid of it. So you didn't have to guess as to what might have been opened. Very convenient. Uh, you had the start menu, which was a great way to very quickly get at all of your running programs. It wasn't hard to edit uh, that start menu. And they really did a nice job, I think, making the user interface a lot more efficient. Another thing that I liked about it is that it reminded me more of the Mac because now I had access to the computer here on the desktop. I could drill into my hard drive just like I did on the Mac. I could load up applications directly uh, through a folder like I could on the Mac. You could do this through the Windows File Manager before, but it just didn't feel as good. And what I liked about this is that it felt like I was no longer compromising with my PC. I had an interface and an operating system that felt a lot like what you would get on a more expensive Mac, and it ran faster. And that, to me, was just awesome for the time. I also liked the fact that I could leave documents here on the desktop and get at them in multiple applications. I had notes that I used to keep for myself there. I still do today. I can just click on them, and boom, there they are. 
and I can get into stuff. And they even replicated the Mac trash bin uh, with the recycle bin here that you could put files in before you completely deleted them. I also like the fact that it was much more integrated with the internet. So of course you had all the leading services here paying for some icons that you could uh, get their applications from there on the desktop. Microsoft had the Microsoft network, but the internet connectivity was now built into the operating system. And that was something that I really struggled with on Windows 3.11 because I was connecting to my internet provider via point-to-point -point protocol. I had to run this thing called the Trumpet Windsock to dial out. And the Windsock thing would lock up all the time. So I'd be on the internet for maybe 30 or 45 minutes. I'd be downloading something and then the connection would freeze. I'd have to reboot and go back into it. Uh, Windows 95 was immediately more effective at keeping my computer connected to the internet provided mom didn't pick up the phone when I was home from college, and it was just a much, much better experience. And overall, uh, just from the interface, it was just so much better than the prior edition. And I just, again, can't imagine a company making this big of a change today, but I think back then it was definitely warranted and needed. Now, Windows 95 for me was much more stable than the prior version, so my old applications would still boot up in the new version, and if they crashed, it wasn't as destructive to the entire operating system. It was a much smoother experience. And then as developers started making software specifically for Windows 95, things got a lot better too. It wasn't perfect, I still had my frustrations, but it was a real improvement over what we were dealing with prior to that. Uh, they also added plug and play hardware, which is something we take for granted today, but this was the first iteration of it. And what you would do is put your thing in the computer, click on the add new hardware, it would sit and chug on it for about 20 minutes and then it would tell you what it found. You would point a disk at it and it would generally install the driver and get you going. Uh, this worked most of the time, depending on the manufacturer of the hardware device. And then as time went on, people were working better with Microsoft to uh, really get these things dialed in and you would often uh, be able to install hardware almost as easily as you do today, so that was nice. And then as you just browse around the system here, a lot of the interfaces that you're encountering are very, very similar to what we deal with today in Windows 10. Some things haven't changed at all, uh, kind of like the device manager here, or if you go into uh, the network settings to change your IP address, those interfaces are pretty much the same on 95 as they are today. So a lot of the things that uh, we've come to know about Windows really started here. And this was such a big, big change. But again, I think it was something that people really welcomed. Now, back in 1995, I would write articles occasionally for an online journal at a neighboring college. And I did a review of Windows 95 that I have re-uploaded to my site at lon.tv slash win95 if you want to get a feel for what I was thinking and feeling back in the day. Now the minimum specifications to run Windows 95 back in the day were pretty substantial. Microsoft said you needed a 386 or better processor. However, in my experience, I found it was not quite usable on a 386. It was super, super slow. So a 486 or better was probably the way to go. It really ran nicely on the Pentium processors, which were new at the time. Uh, but you could get by with a decent 486. Uh, you needed four megabytes of RAM, although the reality was you really needed eight for the best performance. They recommended 70 megabytes of hard drive space, which seems like nothing today. It's a fraction of what we can fit on our little SD cards. But back then, that was a lot of space to give up because hard drives were super expensive, as was the RAM at the time. And it came on 13 floppy disks or a single CD-ROM. I opted for the CD-ROM version, which had a few other goodies baked into it. But look how much it cost to buy a PC back then. So let's say you were buying into the media hype on Windows 95 and you wanted to upgrade to Windows 95 based on a computer that you bought around that time. Uh, well, you would be spending about 2,620 bucks in today's money to get even the lowest spec PC here. So this was a gateway computer ad from 1994 around Christmas time. Uh, a 33 megahertz 486 SX, which lacked the floating point unit, so it wasn't as quick as the DX2 that was next to it here on the list. Uh, four megs of RAM, 340 megabyte hard drive, again, the bare minimum here. You know, it had the CD-ROM, it had all the stuff, including the monitor, but still quite a lot of money to get just the minimum back then. PCs were not cheap by any stretch. They didn't really start getting cheap until about 1998 or so when e-machines started dropping these $500 PCs on the market. 
but you can get a sense as to what it really costs to be able to run this operating system back then. And for a lot of folks, upgrading just wasn't in the cards. But still, Microsoft ran a very aggressive ad campaign. Uh, we're not playing the audio here for copyright reasons, but they got the Rolling Stones to uh, license a song to them for their big rollout. And this was one of the first big consumer pushes that Microsoft did, because for the most part, Microsoft DOS and Windows was just installed on the PC that you bought from a retailer. You never really had a lot of interaction with Microsoft. Uh, consumers who were not computer nerds like me did not go out and buy DOS or Windows. You just bought it with your computer. That's what you ran until you bought the next computer. And I think Microsoft here was really trying to get people to start looking at them as a consumer company. And they spent a lot of money hyping up Windows 95 to consumers. And they also spent a lot of time in the tech press uh, previewing the operating system so you could get a feel for what you were going to be getting when you installed it. And I think that helped set expectations out there amongst the uh, tech crowd to be ready for it when it released, just given how different it was. But all of that media hype really paid off because on release day, they got a ton of press thanks to the midnight sales that they were having. So just like every video game that you've seen over the last 10 years, and just like the iPhone and everything else, there were people lining up at stores at midnight to be the first to own an operating system. I was one of them because my local CompUSA was having a huge sale on top of the Windows 95 offering, and I was able to pick up an extra eight megabytes of RAM for my PC at a dirt cheap price. So I was able to go up to a whopping 16 megs of RAM to run the new operating system. But I could not believe the enthusiasm there was for an operating system back at the time. We wouldn't be lining up today for Windows 10 point whatever, but that's what was happening back then. They really hyped this thing up. And I think for a lot of Windows users, again, they were very excited to get something that made their PCs really run better. And that was the case for the most part. Although a lot of folks who were uh, installing it over existing versions of Windows who maybe didn't meet the minimum specifications or had some other complexities running on their systems or bad drivers or whatever, uh, those folks had a pretty awful time and Microsoft's phones were jammed up with people having trouble and there was a lot of bad press that followed uh, with some nightmare stories of Windows 95 not installing all that smoothly or running all that smoothly for many. But for me, the experience was great and I really did enjoy the operating system. Now, Apple was certainly feeling some pressure at this point given that Microsoft had significantly closed the gap in technology between their two operating systems, at least for consumers. And they started running some ads to uh, kind of troll Microsoft a little bit. So this image ran in the Wall Street Journal, which was kind of making fun of the DOS short file names, although Windows 95 allowed for longer file names. Uh, and then they also ran this ad, uh, which basically went over all the features that had been in Mac OS forever. I don't know how effective these ads were, but they were trying to make the point that, hey, we've been doing this for a long time now. Welcome to the club. Uh, there was a great little article here in the Cult of Mac that talks about what was going on inside of the company and how, to some degree, Windows 95 also influenced the Mac OS in future developments. And the release of Windows 95 really coincided with the decline of Apple. They had a very bad decade in the 90s, and it wasn't until Steve Jobs came back at the tail end of that decade that things got better. And it also involved a very substantial investment from Microsoft to help right the ship over there. So these companies uh, often were at war, but also kind of needed each other. And it's kind of a fun story to read about. And you can see more on that article on screen. So a happy birthday to Windows 95. I can't believe it has been 25 years since I sat in line at that CompUSA to get my big box copy and my stick of RAM, but that is how long it's been. Uh, and right after I got it, I went into my sophomore year in college and off I went. And it's kind of crazy how fast time goes by. Uh, partly why it doesn't feel that long ago is that the interfaces that we're using in Windows are very similar. It's amazing how long this interface has really stuck with people. And it's a real credit to the folks who designed this interface to have it last this long. And you saw what happened when Microsoft tried to change it. So good stuff. And it's really fun to be able to boot it up on my mister. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. I wanna first thank a bunch of folks who contributed via Super Chat during one of our live streams. They include TW116, David Yablonski, Travis Rhodes, The Shield Profit Channel, and Handquake. 
I also want to thank our newest supporter here on the channel, Jesse Ragsdale, who contributed via the YouTube membership program. I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who contributes on an ongoing basis. And I also want to thank all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you want to contribute to the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution. And of course, we support the YouTube membership program and you can click the join button right down below to get a cool badge that appears next to your name whenever you leave a comment or chat. This week on the channel, we did two live streams. One was shooting a video about the GeForce Now service running on Chromebooks, and we also played around with some new Acer Aspire PCs powered by AMD Ryzen processors. You can watch these two and all of my other live streams at the link you see on screen. We didn't get anything uploaded on the Extras channel this week, but we will later this week. And then on the main channel, we had a review of those Acer laptops. We had the video, much shorter, of uh, the GeForce Now service running on Chromebooks. And we also showed how you can run it on things that are not Chromebooks by changing the user agent on the browser. And we took a look at the new Google Pixel 4a, which is a very nice phone that is not all that expensive. So lots of good stuff to check out this week. And you can see all of the videos we mentioned today down below in the video description. We've got a master playlist down there. Uh, this week, I got a couple of things planned. We're going to be taking a look at the Dell XPS 15, the brand new one. I finally shot the video, it's ready to go. So be on the lookout for that. I'm gonna shoot a video this week about the Shadow Game Streaming Service, which allows you to basically get your own Windows 10 computer in the cloud that you can do anything with. Kind of cool to be able to run computers in the clouds here in the future. You couldn't do that with Windows 95. And hopefully we'll get to that uh, Logitech keyboard that I keep talking about. That video's done. It's up on Amazon if you want to watch it. And we'll squeeze it in when we don't have anything else to upload. So we're doing pretty good here on productivity. If you want to be notified whenever I upload anything or go live, you can click on the notification bell to be alerted as to when I will be on your screen. Uh, you can also go to my Amazon shop at lon.tv slash Amazon shop and follow me there because whenever we live stream, we simulcast over on Amazon. So sometimes the quality there is better and sometimes the notifications work better on Amazon than they do on YouTube. So check out that and all of my other channels you see there on screen. Uh, you can sign up for my email list, which is very infrequent at lon.tv slash email. Soon we're going to be doing some live streams with some good deals on stuff, so sign up there. I'll notify you when we do those. We also have my Facebook group, which has over a thousand people, a great way to interact with me and other fans of the show. And then we have my store at lon.tv slash store, where I sell previously reviewed items. And if you want to be notified whenever we put something on the store, you can sign up for the store alert email. And a little later this week, I am going to be cleaning up my office because I am ahead of the game so far uh, this week on video production. So I'm going to be selling some stuff, including those two Acer laptops we just reviewed. So be on the lookout for those. And you can, again, get notified when those get listed by signing up for the email list. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. Thank you all for your continued support. You can see how long I have been a computer nerd for, easily 25 years, but the reality is more like 40. And I uh, really appreciate all of your support. Uh, definitely check out my Mr. videos if you haven't seen them. I'll put a few of them in the video master playlist down below because this is a cool platform that can do a lot more than just run Windows. And it's just been a real blast to play with this. So that's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, David Hockman, Brian Parker, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.